So if you're like me and you grew up in the 1970s, you remember when we tried to make our hot rods street legal. We tried to make them legal so we could drive them on the streets. But it probably never occurred to us that it might be the streets that we need to make legal. And I'm gonna to talk to you about that today, but before I do, I'm gonna tell you a quick story. A story that was inspired by an article in the New Yorker called Bigfoot, written by a guy named Michael Spector. And so, I'm in London, walking home from work one day, thinking about something stupid I've done to irritate my wife again, and I decide that I'm gonna buy her some flowers. So, I stop into a local florist, and search for roses, her favorites. And when I find them, I see that I have two choices. I can buy roses that were grown in the Netherlands or roses that were grown in Kenya. And because I'm the kind of person that wants to do good in the world, that wants to make the right decisions for our future, the decisions that benefit our, our environment, I choose the roses that were grown in the Netherlands. Why? Well, I've always been told that buying local is good. And I know that the roses, <laughs> didn't know that was funny, but that's okay. Um, and I know that the roses that were grown in the Netherlands were shipped via boat, the, the, the most energy efficient way of moving things around the world, and they've only had to come 220 miles. But the roses from Kenya have, had to been, fl have been flown in on a jet the least energy efficient way of moving things from place to place. And even worse, they've had to come 4,200 miles, certainly not local. So I walk home knowing that I'm making the world a better place and making my wife happy, well, at least not mad. But, but when I get home, I start thinking, thinking about the entire life cycle of the roses, not just where they're grown, but how they're grown. And after I do a little digging, I find out that the roses grown in the Netherlands require an incredible amount of unnatural systems to, to, to grow them, while the roses that are grown in Kenya are grown in an almost completely natural setting, requiring almost no energy, minimal fertilizer, and minimal irrigation. And it turns out that this makes a difference, a really, really big difference. The roses grown in the Netherlands have six times the carbon footprint as the roses grown in Kenya. So while I think I'm doing good in the world, making decisions that are getting me closer to my goal, reducing my impact on the environment, I'm actually making decisions that are getting me further from my goal. I'm making a bad decision based on perception instead of reality. And so you're probably sitting here thinking, what does this have to do with streets? Well, it turns out that like the roses from Kenya, streets have gotten a really bad rap for some very unscientific and irrational reasons. So that today, it's almost impossible in most places to project new streets. So like the roses from Kenya, we think streets are a really bad thing, but in fact, they can be quite good for us and for cities. So from the beginning of planning cities, streets have always been the single most important element. We can look at Miletus, one of the first planned cities in the world, and understand that it was simply the projection of streets that play in the city. It did nothing more than tell us what was public, streets, and what was private. Those places where we built things like houses and shops and offices. And it did this through nothing more than the street plan. And it worked pretty well. It worked so well, in fact, that we continue to design cities this way for over 2,500 years. And, and we can look at something closer to home and closer to our time, New York. In 1807, uh, a small group was commissioned to plan everything north of Houston and 14th Street, the entirety of the island of Manhattan. And what resulted was the commissioner's plan of 1811. And it was this plan 
that dictated development of the entire island. And it was nothing more than the projection of streets, a street plan. It did exactly what Hippodamus had done 2,500 years earlier on the coast of the Aegean Sea. Well, what happened? Well, what started out as very undeveloped land, some random villages and farms, was utterly transformed over a period of 200 years. So this simple thing, this street plan, and this only, allowed this to become this. But what was it? What was the magic in this that allowed this to happen? What, what was the sustainable system that allowed a small farmhouse in 1865 to become this? The New York that we know today. Well, the magic, of course, was the street. It was the projection of these streets, a place where we could put all of the things that we use as a community, power, water, sewer, the subway, some place that never changed, so that the individual buildings, a small farmhouse, or a giant high rise could come and go as it pleased, simply plugging into this public system. So we know streets are, are good, but do we know how to put them in place, how to locate them in the world? Well, it turns out that like the roses from Kenya, we can measure the carbon footprint of the roses and measure the operation of the city. And I'm gonna do this through something as simple as a story about a cup of coffee. Back to New York, I'm standing in an intersection at 32nd in Lexington and I get a call from a friend who asked me to come have a cup of coffee. And if this friend is at 42nd in Lexington, 10 blocks, half a mile uptown, I immediately agree, thinking how nice it's gonna to be to walk those 10 blocks uptown. But if that same friend, for instance, is at 32nd and 6th, across town, I hesitate. And if it's not a really good friend, I politely decline. But it's the exact same distance, 2,500 feet, a half mile, then why? Why is it so much more comfortable to walk uptown than it is cross town? Well, it turns out that it has to do with the physical environment. As I'm walking uptown, I'm passing small blocks. I'm crossing many more streets. I'm passing through many changes, so it feels as if I'm walking more quickly, as if I'm getting someplace. But moving cross town, for those of you that have been to New York, you know, you're slogging along those long blocks, crossing fewer streets, and you feel like it's taking a much longer time, like you're, you're taking a much longer journey. And it turns out that small blocks in many streets make us happier and make us more likely to walk. So if we want to design our cities in a way that are walkable, we might want to look at this. But this is New York, and even walking cross town is really not that bad. But if we look at the way most of the rest of the country is designed, say, the somewhat oddly named Perimeter Center in Atlanta, we, we understand that it's, it's the same place where we go and shop, eat at restaurants, meet up with friends, just as we would do in New York, but there's a big difference. That same 10 blocks in New York, here is a single block, and there's nobody walking ever. In fact, I think, I think you would have to put a gun to somebody's head to get them to walk the exact same distance that you would gladly walk in New York. And so what's missing? The streets. They're missing from the planning process, and they're missing from our city. So how did we get here? Well, in the early 20th century, some of my forebears, some architects and planners, got together in a cafe in Paris. And by the way, this is their vision of the new Paris, right? And decided that streets were bad and that we should replace them with something called green space. And who could argue with this? Asphalt is awful. Grass is great, right? But when we did this, we lost something. We lost the streets. And it's very similar to the idea of buying the roses from the Netherlands instead of buying roses from Kenya. And the Supreme Court agreed in 1926. They made a thing called zoning constitutional. They made it the law of the land. And in doing so, they replaced thousands of years 
of planning vibrant, walkable, sustainable cities was something entirely different, almost entirely devoid of streets. And, and we see the result in, in, a, in an ordinance from the city of Atlanta that took this thing, the most important part of cities for thousands of years, and turned it into something that was simply about moving cars around. And even today, those regulations are still in place and have expanded exponentially so that they address everything that could possibly affect a city. With one exception, the street plan. And so this is the one thing that's universally absent from regulations in the country. It's the thing that for thousands of years gave us great, fantastic cities. But because of arcane legal precedents, it's almost impossible and in fact illegal to take streets back. Today, there isn't a single city in the country that uses the street plan as its primary planning foundation, not one. But I think there's hope. There are projects like the Atlanta Beltline. In, 19, in, two, 19, in 2008, the city of Atlanta adopted, for the first time in its history, a street plan that at least covered part of the city. And it did nothing more than tell people where to put streets, exactly as had been done in Miletus and Manhattan and thousands of other cities for thousands of years around the world. It's not perfect. It's still too easy in the planning process to trade a street for something like more brick on a building, but it's a start. And it's something that even 20 years ago would have been impossible to imagine. And so, as we continue to plan and build and rebuild our cities, we might want to remember that the one thing that all great cities have is a great street system. Instead of hating streets, we should love streets. We should love building new streets. And we should make decisions that get us closer to our goal. Decisions that are based not on perception, but on reality. Thank you.